Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to this Wind Power Engineering and Development Webinar, New Solutions for Replacing Unavailable or Obsolete Power Electronics and Wind Turbines. I'm your host, Paul Dvorak, editor of Wind Power Engineering and Development Magazine. Thank you for joining us. Now, just a brief agenda here before I introduce our speakers. The webinar will be available at uh, windpowerengineering.com, and a link to it in the slides will be uh, emailed to everyone who is registered. At the end of the presentation, we'll have a brief question and answer session. Now, of course, not everyone that wanted to attend today's webinar could be here, but you can help them learn from it by tweeting the key points and the takeaways that you think important. In your tweets, be sure to include the hashtag WinWebinar. Now, after the presentation, I'll read the questions that you and the audience have submitted, and you can do that by typing them into the questions box on your GoToMeeting panel that should be to the right of your screen. Now, if you don't find it there, look for a small left pointing red arrow and pick on that, and the question box should appear. Now, I'd suggest not waiting until the end of the presentation, but uh, type your questions in as they come to you, and we'll try to answer as many as possible before our time is up. Now, let me tell you a bit about our speakers. First, we'll hear a brief introduction from John Grulick with PSI Repair Services Incorporated. As the Director of Sales there, John develops service programs for several industries, including wind, uh, military, oil and gas, transit, automotive, steel, and paper and pulp. Or, excuse me, paper and pulp. And then we'll hear from Ron Foucault. Ron is the Director of Engineering and Technology at PSI Repair Services. In this position, he develops repair, test, and reverse engineering strategies, and he manages the design team for new products. So with that, let us begin. Uh, John, why don't you start things off? Thank you, Paul. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, we appreciate everyone taking this time out of their busy schedules. Uh, our goal is to provide a thought-provoking discussion on an area that can be a real problem sustaining electronic parts uh, when they're no longer available, when they're obsolete. And uh, over the years, we've participated in many workshops put on by AWEA. Uh, consistently, their main focus has been on gearboxes, generators, and blades. You know, we get that. You no, know, those are the elephant in the room. They're very, very large capital expenditures. Uh, big cranes have to be brought in. Lots of money gets spent replacing those type of items. But I want to talk today, and our discussion today is about components that are much less in terms of the component cost, but the larger expense of down turbines due to electronic failures, that can really add up. We're in trouble with the control. Trying to get the uh, slide to advance. Okay, so let's talk about change. At the heart of this issue is the constant change in electronics. Whether you're a person that loves change or hates change, you're going to have to deal with it. We all know those people that want a new cell phone every year. They want a new computer every year. So what do they do? Well, they just toss their electronics away and buy a new one because it's, it's in their budget. But you wouldn't buy a new house or a new car every year. You don't do that. Why don't you do that? It's, it's because it's not in your budget. It's too expensive. These are larger purchases that create anxiety, stress. They're very expensive, so we delay making those type of big expenditures. So there are several types of changes. You, you often have the choice under your control, but sometimes you don't. Here. Paul, can you advance that slide? Okay. So obsolescence in electronics. Let's let's go back to the cell phone issue for a minute. There's a new program out that perhaps many of you have seen where the cell phone companies are trying to allow you to purchase a new cell phone each year. Uh, they're making it very easy for you to dispose of your old phone and buy a new one. Why does this happen? Well, because every year the cell phones get more powerful. They have more features, and we all want the latest and greatest. It's human nature. So this constant evolution in electronics, what we would refer to as the consumer world, it really drives the semiconductor industry. So the, the semiconductor industry has something that we refer to as Moore's Law. 
Just click on the slide, John. Okay, there we go. Uh, Moore's Law is an observation of the semiconductor industry. And uh, it states that the number of transistors on integrated circuits, they, they double every two years. So technology doubles every two years. And if you look at this graph, uh, it's largely held true since about the 1950s. So what does this mean to the users of electronics? Well, you're being influenced to replace your electronics every couple of years. A new cell phone, a new computer, a tablet, or if you look back further to the example of how you listen to music, vinyl records, they went to 8-track tapes, they evolved to cassette tapes, to Walkmans, onto iPods, the technology goes on and on. So what is the economic advantage? What's, what's the effect of Moore's Law? Well, it means that manufacturers or OEMs are very motivated to incorporate new technology each year. If you look at the table below, it shows the cost to produce an iPhone or a Kindle in 2010 as your baseline. The iPhone was $600, the Kindle was $139. The computing power was relatively basic. 10 years later, in 2020, the 10, 2010 version of the iPhone could be made for $18.75. And the Kindle is down to $4.34. Much greater computing power. If we take that and extrapolate it out another 10 years, each of these devices could be produced for less than a dollar with significant computing power improvements. So you can't ignore change. Change is constant. But the problem with this cycle in the business world versus the consumer world is that business models for capital equipment are based on much longer cycle times. And the graph illustrates this, uh, showing the rapid increase in technology in contrast to most, most large capital equipment business models. Now you can choose to do nothing. You can choose to ignore this, the reality of obsolescence or sustainment. But at some point, you'll be forced to deal with it. If not, as the photo illustrates, even the most powerful amongst us can be left out in the cold on a, in this example, a very small tip of the iceberg. So sustaining electronic parts which are no longer available. Let's bring it back to your wind farm issues. Your wind turbine was designed to last 20 years. Your financial model is based on 20 years. But halfway through that cycle, the electronic parts you need to repair your turbine are no longer available. So what do you do? Don't feel bad that you don't know. Don't feel like you're alone in the wind industry. It's been our experience that this is a very common reality in many industries, including transit, light rail, cities that have budget constraints, they can't afford to upgrade, the military, various platforms in the Air Force, the Navy, automotive industry, steel, semiconductor, oil and gas, aerospace. It's a similar story across all of these industries today. So, there are all kinds of reasons the OEM is not meeting your expectations. They're not no longer in business. Uh, the wind regime in the United States tends to be fairly dynamic and it caused a lot of problems with the original turbine designs. The design didn't match up to the application. Shock, vibration, and other harsh environmental elements, they're all reasons why the OEM is not meeting your expectations. And for electronics, the largest enemy is too much heat, and that's a very common problem amongst wind turbine uh, situations. So the wind industry is beginning to see the effects of all these things that affect electronics. Failures occur in the form of printed circuit boards, line and rotor IGBTs, anemometers, encoders, drives, inverters, pitch controls, generator controls, some of which are either in short supply or they're just no longer available and they're failing too frequently to keep up with demand. So when you're faced with this problem and your typical source of supply is not meeting your needs, who are you going to call?
our recommendation is to select an aftermarket component supplier that has strong engineering services. The devices you see pictured are typical of what we've found that are obsolete, not meeting the, the design engineering, uh, not available, all in short supply. So who would you go to? Well, you'd go to someone certainly with wind experience. You'd go to a company that has diverse engineering capability, a company that can repair, remanufacture, provide modifications, perform upgrades and improvements, and in the last resort, to be able to manufacture oftentimes in short run type of instances. This company should have resources in the form of technology that allows them to be capable of assuming the same support you would expect of the original equipment manufacturer. They need to be capable of reverse engineering. They need to be able to generate the intellectual property that's required to repair, test, redesign, and upgrade older and obsolete equipment. They need to be capable of taking the original design and integrating new, newer generation electronics that provide better and more efficient solutions. One that will allow you to not only support your MRO, MRO requirements, but really dramatically lower them. So I'd like to now look at a real world example, and I'm going to turn it over to Ron to do that. Okay, thank you, John. Okay. Let's examine a, a typical obsolescence issue, the Xantrax matrix. Those of you joining us today may recognize this device from the picture, and others may just be interested in this type of sustainment issue. Whichever the case, the process used on this project will be very similar to any development we undertake. So let's review the background that led us to this development and how such a design is accomplished. PSI has been repairing this product for a number of years. Recently, one of our customers had been expediting these repairs more frequently. Even with expedited repairs, they encountered turbine downtime, during, especially during their peak summer months. When they were suffering from too little inventory to support their installed base, the OEM no longer makes or supports this product, leaving the customer to fend for themselves. To make matters even worse, our customer was projecting an even greater shortage in the future as the mean time before failure for this product was falling. So just how do you find yourself in this situation? Originally, our customer had adequate inventory, but over the years, they lost some of their spare parts to failures. We call this phenomenon the dropout rate. Let's look at the dropout rate and what it is and how it eventually impacts your operation. We'll use an imaginary wind farm with a population of 200 turbines. Each of these turbines requires two inverters for a total installed base of 400 units. Now let's assume that the initial state of the site to begin operations, the farm starts with 10% spare parts in inventory or 40 units to support their needs. The failure rate is about 1% or about four units per month, but during the summer it increases to 2.5% or 10 units per month. If we let the hot summer month season be three months, the total quantities of the failed inverters per year is approximately 66 units. With the typical repair time and this amount of inventory, the O&M provider easily supports their turbines and does not encounter shortages of the parts. Now let's move forward to the future or what may be your current state. What is the impact of the dropout rate on your farm? The occasional loss of an inverter does not seem like a problem and for several years it is not an issue. But let's assume this loss caused by catastrophic of the failed cores. Each year this amounts to 3.3 inverters per year. At this dropout rate you will slowly lose half of your inventory in six years and would no longer have sufficient spares to support your farms. Expediting every repair is necessary now, but you eventually will have turbines down while your parts are being repaired. And again, you cannot purchase new units to replenish your inventory. There goes your 20 year model. Now let's take a closer look at this situation to gain some insight into the magnitude of the problem. Is this a minor or major issue? The Xantrax matrix inverter is a key component converting the generator power to DC which powers the DC link, is identified by the converter AC to DC box in my block diagram. The DC link 
or DC bus as some call it, is further manipulated by a second Xantrax matrix inverter to create synchronized AC at the desired line voltage and frequency. This function is shown as the inverter DC to AC block. The output power is then available to the grid after various stages of step up transformers at the turbine and substation. The inverter in this system is obviously a very critical component and one that is known to fail frequently. Without it, you cannot move the generated power to the grid. The Xantrex matrix is actually two devices in one. It can be used to convert AC into DC or invert DC into AC as explained earlier. In this application, it performs both functions. A matrix unit consists of a high voltage, high current IGBT switching section, appropriate drivers for the IGBTs, DC power supplies, and fault detection circuitry. For those of you not familiar with the term IGBT, it stands for insulated gate bipolar transistor, and it's essentially a very efficient specialized transistor which excels at handling large currents. All of these components come together to form the inverter and were custom designed to install in the cabinet shown, which is located in the ground level of the wind turbine base. So let's examine the feasibility of using a commercially available unit to replace this inverter. The two matrix units are installed at the top left-hand side of the control cabinet as shown in the figure to the right. The installation location and the size of the unit are dictated by the control enclosure and mounting of related com components in the cabinet. Changing this inverter to a different form factor would most likely require a total rework of the control cabinet and possibly most down tower devices. It's possible, yes, but not without significant rework in time. Complicating matters further, the current control unit, or CCU, uses a custom fiber optic communication to the inverters, which is not compatible with most off-the-shelf commercial products. Okay, let's review your options. The OEM. Well, we already know the OEM stopped manufacturing this part and no longer supports it. This is a dead end. Use a standard commercially available inverter. This option still requires substantial redesign of your control cabinets and a custom electrical interface. It's generally risky. You can upgrade your entire control system. It's expensive and can be risky as, as it involves changing most every major component in your turbine and the loss of availability during changeover adds another expense. Engineering services, the third option, is probably unfamiliar to most of you. What exactly is this option? <clears throat> well, it's a drop-in form fit and function replacement designed for this application. It's a low effort alternative with improved performance. It's a low risk as there's nothing to buy if it does not work. It's low cost because it requires no changes to your system. It is also the fastest solution to address your sustainment issues. It is a replacement that is handled by experienced engineering company familiar with this application. We make the hard decisions and provide a field proven solution. What we are introducing here is an engineering service performed most importantly by a company intimately familiar with the unique problems of the wind industry. It means we understand the factors critical in preventing failures in wind systems. Our company has repaired over 10,000 wind components and we understand what causes your failures and issues. For instance, thermal performance. From our extensive experience in repairing these products, we know that thermal issues cause the majority of the failures. Our design utilizes a high performance switching section which creates less waste heat to dissipate. We also use a thermal interface material, or TIM, which is 10 times more efficient at transferring heat than thermal paste and does not degrade over time. This lowers the IGBT substrate temperature, a key failure factor. We understand fault protection is important. Our design has advanced fault protection far exceeding the original equipment capability. PSI includes under voltage protection, IGBT short circuit protection and active clamping. These fact, fast acting circuits represent the latest in fault detection and shut down the IGBT before failures occur. 
We know harnesses and fiber optic cables degrade with time. We know the connector pins are a weakness in the system. Each of our systems include new cables and fiber optic components. And most importantly, a drop-in interchangeable design is required to make changeover seamless. The PSI inverter is a drop-in form fit and function replacement for the OEM product and can be mixed with the OEM product without issues. Details make the difference. Our background and experience means a better product. We are familiar with the environment. PSI knows the original product can suffer from condensation issues in cold climates or where there's high humidity. Water collecting in small pockets on the original bus board design can provide a shorting path for high voltage. Our design does not have this weakness. Farms are constructed in remote locations. We know how to protect our products across dirt roads and the need for reusable shipping and storage containers at the farm. We also know these devices are heavy and have designed our custom reusable crates to be easily loaded from the front. PSI knows the IGBT in the OEM design is made by only one supplier. Production lead time issues from the, this supplier in the past have created a large market for counterfeit IGBTs. These counterfeit parts have made it to the farms and caused premature failures. Our inverter was designed to use a common IGBT layout, which can be sourced from one of three manufacturers. This helps alleviate lead time and counterfeit issues during peak usage months. So what do we do with all this information? We take it and we generate a list of goals in our design project. The first and foremost of, the, of the, these goals was the form, fit, and function. These units must be drop-in replacements, and I emphasize must as a design goal. Our customers would not be required to modify their turbines and could mix our product with the OEM product interchangeably. In fact, you may use the same internal part numbers to track this device. The next design goals were in the nice-to-have category. We wanted better thermal efficiencies to increase longevity. We know heat is a big cause of failure, and the design which operates cooler would have a substantial advantage in operating life. Our goal was to generate less heat and remove it more efficiently. Another goal, fast fault detection. It helps prevent failures by shutting down the inverter in the event of control issues. We take advantage of the latest techniques to improve inverter reliability. Our loss of power supply voltage causes a safe orderly shutdown. Our monitoring of DVDT or rate of voltage increase helps snub large voltage spikes which can damage the IGBT and our fast current monitoring can short, shut down short circuits before damage can occur and of course thermal monitoring is supplied. Another nice to have goal, longer life, is made possible by utilizing new next generation IGBT manufacturing technologies. As manufacturers of these high power devices become more experienced, their bonding and manufacturing processes improve, resulting in products which last longer, typically 10 times longer for each new generation manufacturing process. The PSI uses a common IGBT mounting pattern available from multiple sources. Multiple source IGBTs are a safer starting point. The OEM design uses a single source IGBT which could not readily be crossed. In peak usage months, times grew long and the parts became highly counterfeited. Finally, we listened to customer suggestions about placement of indicator lights and connectors to make the units easily serviceable. Now that we have our design goals established, let's look at the steps and what happens in our design process. The first task is IGBT selection. For this application, we needed a newer generation IGBT, one which handles the worst case loads and a common form factor. As we explained earlier, manufacturers of the IGBT classify their products by generation. Each successive generation has improved life. Unfortunately, manufacturers do not use a common data sheet format preventing direct comparison models. This means thermal simulations must be developed to determine suitability 
of the IGBT and subtle trade-offs can be necessary to determine the best device. The next step in our development process is the driver board. This includes the communication circuitry and power supplies. This board, or actually boards, handles communication from the current controller to the IGBT, IGBT switching signals, power supplies, and safety or fault functions. Designed properly, it will lower the operating temperature by switching the IGBT efficiently and prevent failures by shutting down when abnormal conditions appear to be developing. The third step in the process is the heat sink design. This is essentially providing adequate surface area for the heat load anticipated while maintaining continuity of the physical installation requirements. The existing design can be used as a starting point, but any additional heat dissipation efficiencies will help us create a longer lasting product. We also look for methods to reduce the manufacturing cost of this component at this point. The last step is the bus board design. The new bus board must interface to our new IGBTs, provide clearances for mounting the bus capacitors and driver boards, and line up perfectly with the rigid bus bars in the existing controller. It must also be designed to avoid condensation pooling issues that have been seen at some locations. It all starts to come together at the first prototype, uh, as the first prototypes are assembled. Um, we test turn off and turn on drive signals at the IGBT gate. We're looking at turn on and turn off switching signals at the IGBT, full current switching signals to look for ring, high voltage switching signals to check for excessive spiking, fault detection, clearances, and assembly issues. After respinning parts which may need component changes or modifying design where necessary, our alpha prototypes are ready for field tests. This three months later, our prototype is completed. This is a 3D rendering of our design. We design all assemblies in 3D to help identify interference issues and help us visualize the final products. Prototypes were shipped to our customer with PSI engineers assisting in the startup. The prototypes were tested in the field under varying conditions and installations. First, they were installed together as a set with both prototypes installed in the same turbine, one in the line position and one in the rotor position. This validates functionality and operation and compatibility. After a month in operation, they were installed in separate turbines with the OEM equipment. One prototype was installed in the rotor side of an OEM inverter installed on the line side. The second was installed in the line side with an OEM device installed in the rotor position. These tests were conducted to test interchangeability. The final long-term test moved both prototypes to the rotor side installation. This is far more stressful than the line position as voltages and currents are higher. The final result, when faults were detected, the PSI design signaled the fault and shut down. The adjacent OEM unit was destroyed, signifying a successful shutdown under adverse conditions. Our units also run cooler than the OEM product, typically five degrees cooler at the heat sink and faulted to prevent failures. The original prototypes have been running in the field now for approximately 11 months. Um, now, you may have noticed that I repeated myself several times in this presentation when discussing the important thermal performance, IGBT selection, fault detection, and bus design. That was done purposely. Without our wind energy experience, we could have designed the system, and it would have worked. But we firmly believe our experience and knowledge in these areas resulted in a superior product for the wind energy field. Let's return back to our 20-year model now. Where are we today? Our customers have ordered units to support their inventory requirements. The new devices are drop-in replacements, so no modifications are required. The price for the replacement devices is similar to the cost of new. There were no design costs for the customers on this project. So to summarize, it was low risk, low cost, 
fast and the problem is now solved. PSI performs similar design projects for military, industrial, and transit industries. We would be happy to discuss your questions or projects with you. Please visit us at the link shown on this slide for additional information. And as a final takeaway, I would like to announce that PSI continues to work on many replacement products for the wind industry and will release the big brother to this inverter, the Clipper Matrix replacement later this year. Thank you, and Paul, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, guys, nicely done. And you know, as a mechanical engineer, I always enjoy learning about uh, a little bit more about the electrical side of the wind industry, so thank you for that. Well, I'll tell you what, let's wrap up with a few questions from the audience. Okay, John, I think this first one's for you. You made reference to technology that lets an engineering services company provide the same support as an OEM. Uh, can you elaborate on what you refer to as technology? Uh, sure, Paul. Um, well, the technology that we utilize uh, involves a significant investment in hardware, uh, in-circuit testing equipment, uh, surface mount equipment, and then a lot of peripheral equipment that allows us to work on both analog and older electronics as well as some of the newer generation electronics. Uh, this technology can uh, generate schematics. It can really develop the intellectual property that allows us to repair, remanufacture, perform the upgrades that uh, Ron described, uh, manufacture equipment. Um, but one of the most important things is having the people that work with this type of equipment day in and day out uh, because it's not the easiest equipment to use and work with, but you become extremely proficient if you're challenged with it every day. So, for example, we've had uh, engineers come in for the U.S. Navy and they've seen the type of programming and, and schematics that we can generate uh, sometimes in a day or two and they've been candid and said, you know, this would take our folks three to six months. So it's a combination of the technology and the people, Paul. Okay, very good. Um, Shane wants to know, um, this is for either of you guys, is there a list of components that you can or have provided for the wind turbines? Sure. Uh, yes, if, if we get Shane's uh, contact information, okay. we'll, uh, we'll provide him that information. Be glad very to. Good. Okay, good. Hey, here's one for you, Ron. Um, you talked about counterfeit parts. Can you elaborate on what type of counterfeit issues you have encountered? Yes, the, um, in this particular instance, the IGBT used on the uh, Xantrix matrix was um, manufactured by Infineon, and it has an odd form factor, and there are not other IGBTs that can be bolted right in place with similar performance. Um, they are um, slightly different mounting patterns, and uh, it means we can't use anything else on this heat sink. Um, last two years ago, Infineon had some delivery problems and were running very late, which opened up a huge counterfeit market on this IGBT. We saw four different counterfeit parts from different sources um, in the field, uh, we've seen them from in our inventory. We've seen them um, in distributor warehouses, and these are very good IGBT counterfeit parts, but they don't meet the original performance. The, the problem that arises when you have a single source for these parts is if they can't deliver, you're very tempted to go to unauthorized distribution sources to try to get your product back in operation. Once you do this, you can get these counterfeit parts some are easy to detect, some are difficult to detect, but if you have multiple sources for your parts, you don't have to worry about that. You can always go through authorized distribution changes. changes. Um, I'll just say that the, the counterfeit parts used on this ran the gamut from actual Infineon parts to parts made by um, other companies that were nowhere near close to the same performance specs and would work for a week or two in the field and then would fail. And it caused a, a terrible problem for uh, wind turbine operators uh, two years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, very good, very good. Uh, Amir asks a question here. He says, uh, when you design it to such a device, you're almost creating a device that would compete with other inverter converter manufacturers. Now, this can probably be said for many such cases. What keeps you from going into, what, into that market and straying 
from a repair company. Want to take a shot at that, John? I'll give it to Ron. Okay. The um, well, we're a service company. Um, we provide repair services, and in addition to that, um, we provide design services and. Um, to support those design services uh, are manufacturing of some products. Um, the products that we make are requested by us from our customers. They bring to us sustainment issues. Uh, they bring to us problems in the field that um, are reoccurring, and they ask us to improve the device, remove the sustainment issues, and produce something that um, will help them uh, continue to use uh, their system. So we don't actually have a product line of our own, but we, we have products that are built as a result of our engineering uh, services. Mm -hmm. uh, well, let me ask a question. Do, do you ever repair a part that's also available from an OEM? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we, uh, we are an alternative to the original equipment manufacturer, and there's a whole host of reasons why a customer would choose to come to us versus going back to the original equipment manufacturer. Uh, speed, turnaround time, competitiveness, um, looking at their failures and drilling down to why things are failing, what's the root cause of that failure, what is a short and long-term corrective action. Uh, those are the type of things that we look for. And it's not that the original equipment manufacturer couldn't do that as well, but uh, you know, for various reasons, we've been more responsive on those type of activities. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, Shane asks another question, you guys. Uh, what turbine OEMs have you worked on? Uh, Vesta, Suzlon, GE, Clipper, Siemens, and so whatever? Mitsubishi, General Electric, Siemens, Vestas. Those are the main ones right there. What about Clipper? I, I don't think they're manufacturing anymore, are they? I'm not exactly sure what Clipper is doing, but we've had a lot of response from the uh, wind industry on asking for support on Clipper equipment, and uh, we've been repairing circuit cards out of the Clipper turbines, and as Ron said, we're about to introduce a uh, inverter drop-in replacement for the Clipper inverter. Okay, very good. Uh, here's another question for you, Ron. Um, Let's see. You've worked on the Zantex matrix. Uh, are other matrix, uh, are there matrices from other manufacturers that you reverse engineering in a similar manner? Yes. Well, um, as we spoke about, the Clipper matrix is the next one, or the Clipper inverter uh, is the next one that will be released. But um, as far as the GE turbines go, um, the IGBT systems and those are portions of the inverter section. Uh, of that turbine, and um, PSI manufacturers at IGBT um, replacement um, as a um, like replacement, and we are also developing an improved uh, IGBT system. All right, very good. And Ron, I think this is one's for you too. Uh, you mentioned uh, using newer electronics, newer generation electronics. Can you can you provide examples? Yeah, it, it's uh, twofold. One is the, the IGBT themselves, are, I won't say they're new devices, but um, the manufacturing technology keeps improving um, on these devices and specifically the uh, bonding wires and bonding technology used uh, on the substrates and the interconnection wires. Um, as the manufacturers improve on that technology, the IGBTs last longer. They call them generations of IGBTs, and typically each generation um, can handle about 10 times more switching cycles, which can directly um, correlate to the life of the unit. Uh, also, the drive circuitry for IGBTs are getting mo uh, more and more advanced, and there are ways to detect um, short circuits as they begin to happen. Even though current in an IGBT rises very quickly, it's still possible to uh, tell the difference between a standard switching cycle and short circuits that occur. So new techniques, new manufacturing techniques, and new products help make these things last longer and perform better. Okay, very good. 
Um, Ron, you're a popular guy. Here's another one for you. What do you expect in running life for your upgraded matrix compared to the original design? Um, we believe that um, the up, our upgraded matrix is going to last about twice as long as the original design. It uh, it runs cooler. Um, again, the new um, next generation IGBT and our thermal interface material is much more efficient, which means that we'll be able to dissipate the heat and keep the IGBT cool. Would fault protection help the life as well? Fault protection will also help, yes. Okay, very good. And uh, Ron, once again, uh, can you describe in a little more detail the criteria used in the design tasks you outlined? Yes, um, part of the criteria comes from um, our experience in the repair side. So we see the parts that fail more and more often. Um, IGBTs, uh, sometimes the IGBTs back up and blow up the driver boards. Um, we've been asked to conduct failure analysis on uh, a lot of the IGBTs, and when we do, we, we determine whether they're heat-related problems or short circuits caused by um, uh, shoot-through of the IGBTs from the positive to minus bus. Um, so we kind of know failure modes. Once you know the failure modes, you can start to look at designs which address those that are more robust. So in this case, um, the IGBT, in the selection of the IGBT, we have to find one that uh, one is available from multiple sources. We have to find one that handles at least the same amount of current and, and voltage as the original IGBT and hopefully more than that. Then we back up into the driver board and our goal there is to turn on the IGBT faster. So we have to have a drive circuit that is capable of handling um, much more current um, in the form of a pulse to turn on the IGBT and turn it off. Mm -hmm. um, so as we're, as we're going through each design stage, the part that we're looking at downstream, the IGBT, dictates some of the parameters for the control board. And then the control board and the IGBT, IGBT combination help us understand what we might have to do on the heat sink. Um, and then in this case, uh, a bus board which ties it all together. Um, and those are um, more mechanical specifications than electrical. I see, very good, okay. Um, there's a question from James. I can understand why you would develop a drop-in replacement for a defunct company like Xantrex but aren't you troubled by reverse engineering a product that's owned by someone else? Uh, sounds like something I would hear from China. Uh, John, any comment? Um, you know, our, our customers that we are dealing with in, in this instance, they either cannot get the product, they can't get it soon enough, um, it's, it's obsolete, the OEM is not meeting their expectations, so we're merely, we're filling a need. Uh, we're providing a service. Uh, we're customer driven and we respond to our customers in, in fashion. They're asking for these devices and we want to minimize, you know, the expense to them and the time for them to replace them. So we make it as easy as possible. As Ron said, form fit function is, is absolutely essential. I, I like to think of it as helping the wind industry become a little more stable. Um, we have one upgrade that is um, an upgrade to a unit and the manufacturer uh, still produces the product. Um, our upgrade makes the product last about twice as long, maybe three times as long. Um, it's a product that's used up tower and the cost of replacing this device um, is very expensive, turbines down, sending technicians up. So when we have a, an upgrade that can make this product last twice to three times as long, you are saving the O&Ms and the farm owners a lot of expense on their cost, and this this doesn't hurt the wind industry. It just makes it better. Okay, all right, John. I've got one last question for you. Then, okay, now you talked about creating intellectual property. What types of equipment are used to create this? Uh, we utilize in-circuit testers that are uh, they're manufactured to work in conjunction with old and new electronics. Um, they can take a, a circuit card and really determine what's on the card, the inner workings of the card, 
uh, they generate a schematic, and then we utilize some other equipment to really put that into a, a, a fashion that a technician could use to both troubleshoot uh, on the repair side or to utilize uh, from the engineering standpoint to manufacture redesign. Uh, other equipment that's utilized is, you know, surface mount equipment and, uh, and really having the traditional bench equipment that you need for the analog portion of the, uh, of the circuit card, for example. So it's a, it's a combination, and I, I'll emphasize again the, uh, the need to have skilled technicians that are utilizing this equipment every day. It's, uh, it's critical to have people that have the aptitude and the, uh, the experience. Okay, I one late question, question that came in from Richard, and I think maybe this is for Ron. Is, have you found problems of mistriggering in the IGBT in the PCB board that controls the IGBT, the AGDR board? Can you, does, that, does that make sense? Uh, yes, yes. Um, the, I, I don't know whether I would classify them as mistriggering. Um, when they are, uh, the IGBTs are turned on and off uh, properly, um, there uh, are not issues with the IGBT. Um, often the IGBT is switched on and not switched off properly um, and that causes the IGBTs to blow up if they, um, the, the upper and lower IGBTs happen to be on at the same time. Um, I guess uh, the, the signals are developed correctly. Noise in the system may cause them not to trigger at the right times. Um, if there's a failure, it's either caused by heat-related uh, problems on the IGBT itself or switching at the wrong time. Um, the control systems are designed to switch them at the right times, but noise and spikes and such um, can cause it to turn on and cause catastrophic failures. So that is a, a failure mode. Okay, well that was it. Uh, okay, we're just about running out of time, ladies and gentlemen, but once again, this webcast will be available for reviewing at windpowerengineering.com. And one final message, you can follow uh, Wind Power Engineering on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. This concludes our presentation. I want to thank everyone for their attention from, from the staff here at Wind Power Engineering and Development and from PSI Repair Services. We wish you a good and productive day. Thank you.